This is the kind of marketing that was um, my kids were being exposed to when they were younger. They're a bit more grown up now. And um, it's SpongeBob SquarePants, and he's promoting Happy Meals to kids. And you can join the Kids Club and become a part of a fantastic uh, group, and you will get marketing um, and promotions from them. And then one day my kids turned around to me and said, you're a fun sponge. And I thought, great. I'm like, SpongeBob SquarePants, and I'm really fun. And they said, no, you soak up all the fun. And I said, well, what are you talking about? And they said, oh, you take our McDonald's vouchers, and, and when we get that stuff from the Hungry Dad's Kids Club, you take it and you never give it back. You won't let us go to McDonald's, and, and you're a fun sponge. So then I went to Universal Studios, and there was Spongy, my favourite person, and I tried to talk to him, but he was mute. Um, and he didn't respond, but um, I, I did have a go, and I said, I'm a fun sponge too, you know. Uh, but he had nothing to say about that. Um, and, you know, as my daughter got older, she got involved in basketball, and McDonald's came to her school and took them out to play basketball, and she won the competition, very excited. She got the size 16 T-shirt, which she's still wearing, 19, and still fits, and um, she got a voucher to go to McDonald's, and the coach rang me up and said, Jane, I'm really sorry about this, but we're all going to McDonald's to celebrate with our vouchers, and I was like... OK, off you go. And I just thought, how can a parent combat this kind of thing? And what really irritated me was the relationship between sport and junk food. Such a ridiculous um, uh, um, uh, pairing. Uh, and I felt very powerless to intervene. So needless to say, when I moved to, from tobacco uh, control into obesity prevention, uh, I had some experience through my children. And I was pretty concerned. So the Obesity Policy Coalition is a group of public health organisations, Cancer Council Victoria, Diabetes Australia Victoria, and the WHO Collaborating Centre for Obesity Prevention at Deakin University. And all those organisations understood how we uh, worked in tobacco control around policy and regulation, uh, not just trying to change people's behaviour by educating them, but trying to change the environment to create a supportive environment for health. And policy and regulation are really important parts of that. So I have a team with two lawyers, and I normally don't go anywhere without my lawyers, but one's in New York and one's home looking after her little baby. So I'm here alone, so be gentle with me. And the kind of elements we need in obesity um, to prevent overweight and obesity and to try and um, try and influence the drivers are looking at advertising and promotion, looking at the availability of food, what, what shapes our choices, um, looking at labelling and what kind of information can you put on packaging and at the point of sale, and uh, of course tax and pricing measures which can be very powerful and we've seen that in particularly in tobacco control. So advertising and promotion to children is basically self-regulated and I won't go into it, it's very, very complicated. Uh, but basically if, a, if an advertisement is directed to children, there are some controls on it. But industry oversees this um, system and we made a complaint about a Smarties website with a competition which was open for three to ten year olds to colour in something. And we made a complaint to the Advertising Standards Board, the lawyer made it because it's very complicated, and they said, well, actually, that wasn't directed to, ch to children. Right, well, okay, really? No, no, because they changed the website, said, two parents get your child too. It's like, oh, okay. Ridiculous. What's not covered? Well, you're not allowed to advertise premiums to children, and I would have thought a toy would have been a premium. You know, you buy a fast food meal and you get SpongeBob SquarePants or Collector Four Simpsons toys. You all know what those are, you've seen them before. We love Bart and his family. We made a complaint about that. They're a premium. No, they're not a premium. They're an integral part of the meal. Well, my kid never ate them. They don't come with any nutritional information. And so they're not covered. So, uh, you know, these are the big holes in self-regulation. Company-owned websites aren't covered. This is this gorgeous gorilla who um, promotes chocolate yoghurt. Uh, this is part of the, uh, this is one of the fun sponge things I took from my children. These are the finger puppets. They hated me taking this because you got a free Sunday uh, with your kids club meal. So they were very upset about this. But you can see, again, covered in sporting images. 
Uh, this is my local sports and aquatic centre. Uh, I was wondering if they got any money from Nestle. That is a huge water slide and it's um, um, put up during um, school holidays. It's fabulous. Uh, but, you know, I think it's advertising drumsticks and it's, I mean, how can, if you do sport, it doesn't matter if you throw junk food around. They used to have a Fanta inflatable, but um, I put that in a publication, it's gone now. <laughs> but um, this is really concerning. This is sending really mixed messages to kids. Um, right, I'm just segueing into per portion control and portion size. So. Um, when you, uh, in America, portion sizes are completely out of control and we are moving more into that kind of um, uh, phase. So bigger is better, spend more, get more. And you kids would know if you can get something for not much more, say 50 cents at Macca's, you're going to buy it because it's great. You get a large chips for the same price as a medium or you do the meal deal and you get the drink thrown in. Um, in America, um, they've really tried to control portion sizes. In New York City in particular, um, Mayor Bloomberg has tried to um, restrict the size, these super sizes of these drinks. And you can see how much sugar is in these drinks. I, when I was investigating how large these drinks were, I found that you can get a double gulp, which is 64 fluid ounces. I mean, that's nearly two litres of, um, of drink. But there's a huge amount of sugar in these drinks as well. And New York City's done a lot of work to explain how much sugar is in these uh, products. And sugar is known to uh, be a risk factor for overweight and obesity in children and in adults. So New York done a lot of work um, around sugar. But um, other sort of controls that you can put around food are things like the school canteen. You cannot have these products for sale, like sugary drinks, chips, in the school canteen, in workplaces, in hospitals, um, which help people make the healthy choice because it's the easy choice. And that's really what we have to look towards, you know, where we work um, in our schools, in our community centres. Why are they, why can, it, in, in MSAC, it's quite hard to find a water fountain. What can you get? You can get sports drinks. Well, I, I bet most people in there are not elite athletes and they don't need a sports drink. And they are full of sugar and salt. So I think we need to look at what's, you know, what's available around us that's shaping our decisions. And particularly in uh, places which are open to the public and are health promoting. And to that end, New York has controls around the nutritional, um, the nutritional value of the foods that can be served in hospitals, in prisons, everywhere that they fund, the city funds, they have guidelines around what can be served um, to people that work there or are incarcerated or whatever. You can change the default. So this was in, um, when I went to Ireland, I've, I've just been on a Churchill Fellowship for um, a few months. And when I went to Ireland, I noticed this. This is in a cafe, chain cafe. They've changed the default to low fat milk. Imagine if Starbucks did that. Imagine if the big chains did that. That would make a huge difference to people's diets. Uh, and low fat milk is standard. So if you want something else, you ask for it. And I think that's a fantastic way of changing what's called the choice architecture to again support um, healthy choices. Labelling is another way that um, we can influence uh, people's decisions. And you can see here, this is a bit of a bit confusing. We know people find it confusing. It's called the uh, percent daily intake. It's an industry sponsored scheme. Um, and I don't know if that's very meaningful for you. You probably can't read it. Um, there's a lot of information there and it has no sort of interpretive element. And what I mean by an interpretive element is this. This is traffic light labelling which public health groups were advocating for. Um, it talks about fat, saturated fat, salt and sugar. The colours, if it's high it's red, if it's medium it's um, orange and if it's low it's green. So this is interpretive. I think you'd argue that yoghurt tops weren't as healthy as I thought they might be. Um, and now uh, both those schemes have been set aside and we've worked together with uh, the food industry, public health groups and government to develop a new scheme which is a STAR scheme. So the more STARS the better and it has information on saturated fat, sugars, um, 
salt and then overall energy. And that will be rolled out within about a year. You'll start seeing that on food packaging and we're hopeful that there will be a social marketing campaign and that that will help drive people to healthier choices because when you're in a supermarket, it's very hard at the moment to compare products. The nutrition information panel, you have to take the product off the shelf, the kids are screaming, you know, you've got a lot going on and you want to make decisions quickly. So this is hopefully a tool that will support people to do that. But it is a bit of an experiment because it hasn't been done any anywhere in the world, but the stars, um, you know, the more stars the better on electrical goods and things like that. So hopefully people kind of understand the concept. This is uh, another New York initiative where they regulated um, kilojoules on um, foods in the restaurant itself, in the chain. So that's pretty clear and easy to understand and um, it was announced that the Victorian government would do the same thing um, after the Premier went to New York but we've since had a change of government and that hasn't been implemented but industry is rolling it out in some stores in Victoria so you might have seen that in McDonald's or whatever. This is how it's being rolled out in Wales. Now, it's not regulated there, it's really hard to read and I would argue that that was not a mistake. And so, you know, it's one thing for industry to voluntary do, voluntarily do something, it's probably better if government puts some controls around that to make sure it's done well. I'd like to just start, um, finish talking about um, policy by, by um, referring to price and we know price is a really important driver. This might be a little bit complicated, but this is the real price of milk versus soft drinks. Now, why are people drinking so much soft drink? Because, and I, I, sorry, I haven't got the change of the cheap milk on here, but there's a huge differential between um, the real price of soft drink and the real price of milk, which has gone up at a much higher rate. So, you know, this is what drives people's behaviour. I'm very price sensitive, um, as are a lot of people. Uh, this is a similar slide. This shows um, bread and cakes and biscuits. So you can see the relative price of bread has gone up much more at a much greater gradient than um, cakes and biscuits. So, you know, we've just had the dietary guidelines. People are eating a lot of these extra foods, way too much of these extra foods. And these are some of the reasons why, because they're heavily promoted, they're very cheap, they're available. It's much easier to get um, out here to get a can of Coke or a donut than an apple. So, you know, this is what sh our environment is shaping um, our behaviours. So, you know, I don't think we should be surprised we have an obesity problem. Um, and I don't think I've told you what the problem is, but you probably already know it's 25% of children are overweight or obese and 63% of adults and 85% of men between the ages of 35 and 65 are overweight or obese. This is a huge chronic disease problem and if a child's in that category when they're an adolescent, they're likely to track into adulthood and the growth area is in obesity. So this is a big, big problem health problem and a big cost potentially to government. So what else is happening out there? Well government, public health groups, we're all really concerned about what's going on. This uh, diagram represents um, 11 of the global food brands. They're big powerful companies, they are international, they're multinational. Now they're not sitting on their hands just watching this unfold. They want to be, as we heard Coke say yesterday, part of the solution. But they won't admit that they're part of the problem. <laughs> they're just taking one side of it. But they are very aware that they are under scrutiny and that there is a high levels of concern, not just by government, but by the community at large. And I just want to read you something that the um, WHO, the World Health Organization Director General, addressed a health promotion conference in Helsinki a few weeks ago. And I just thought it was pertinent to um, hear what she had to say about industry and their role in health promotion. It's clear it's not just big tobacco anymore. Public health must also contend with big food, big soda and big alcohol. All of these industries fear regulation and protect themselves by using the same tactics.
These include front groups, lobbies, promises of self-regulation, lawsuits and ind industry funding research that confuses the evidence and keeps the public in doubt. Tactics also include gifts, grants and contributions to worthy causes that cast these industries as respectable corporate citizens in the eyes of politicians and the public. They include arguments that place the responsibility for harms to health on individuals and portray the government actions as interference in personal liberties and free choice. We've all heard about the nanny state. Efforts by industry to shape the public health policies and strategies that affect their products are problematic. When industry is involved in policy making, rest assured the most effective control measures will be downplayed or left out entirely. That too is well documented or dangerous. So when you look at the size of these industries and the amount of money they have to lose, you can understand why they want skin in the game. And how do they do it? Well, this was the age yesterday. Uh, this was Rob Moody and me. We call what Coca-Cola is doing as weight washing because they're trying to minimise their impact and put the focus back onto the individual and really back onto physical activity. They don't want to stop aggressively marketing to kids like this down the front. They want to do their share of Coke campaign. The head of that marketing campaign is now going to roll it out in Europe. And they were very, very smug when they were saying how many teens had tried Coke and how much Coke they had in fact sold to teens. And this is not what we want in a society where our children are our future. We want them to be healthy and happy and grow up with good habits. And they undermine people like me, parents who are really fighting an uphill battle. And who else is industry getting into bed with? Well, I was waiting at a bus stop in Washington and this popped up. This is Coca-Cola supporting the Heart Foundation's um, Healthy Heart for Women. This is a really bad precedent. So, I suppose um, there's a lot we need to be to do. We're up against very big opposition. Uh, I'm a fun sponge. I'm still out there. And this is my friend, SpongeBob SquarePants, in uh, New York City, finding his next prey. Thank you very much.